morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the MedResults Network 2017 Educational Webinar Series. I'm Jamie Parrott, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for MedResults Network, and I want to thank you all for taking some time to join us for this exclusive presentation today. This is our 40th webinar in our educational webinar series, and we're absolutely thrilled to be discussing a brand new topic that we've never covered during our presentations in the past. In the last six months, we've received uh, numerous requests from members asking about women's health devices, which offered uh, the most effective treatments for their patients. So after much due diligence, uh, we launched a partnership with a women's health company about two months ago uh, called Vivive, and they're the creators of the Genevieve system. And the Genevieve system, for those of you who aren't familiar, is currently available in over 40 countries for treating vaginal laxity to improve sexual function and it's the only non-surgical single session treatment to do this. And here in the U.S., it actually has FDA clearance for general surgical procedures, uh, electrocoagulation, and hemostasis. Um, is this has been such a hot topic of discussion, both in MedResults Network and outside of our network in the industry, uh, we decided to bring in an expert this morning to uh, present our webinar today. So to move forward to get to our presentation, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Michael Krishman our special guest presenter. Um, as a doctor of sexual medicine, a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist, and a sexual uh, counselor and author, uh, Dr. Krishman has devoted his entire career to helping patients and their partners overcome sexual health challenges and experience a higher quality of physical intimacy. Uh, Dr. Krishman is also a specialist in survivorship medicine and provides life coaching and care plans to optimize the health and wellness of patients with chronic diseases or cancer. And he's also currently the executive director of the Southern California Center for Sexual Health and Survivorship, as well as the medical director of sexual medicine at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach, uh, which is just down the road from us. Uh, he also contributes as a clinical faculty member at the University of Southern California here in Los Angeles as well. So we are absolutely divided, uh, delighted to have such an expert in this arena uh, to join us today. Uh, today, Dr. Krishman is going to provide a high-level overview of the causes of female sexual dysfunction, some of the symptoms of vaginal laxity, and of course, new and, and effective solutions to treat patients uh, who may be experiencing these issues. So before we begin, if you have questions for Dr. Krishman, please let us know after the presentation in our automatic survey that will pop up directly following the close of the presentation. And keep in mind that whether you have a question or not, your feedback is really important to us. So it only takes 20 seconds to fill out, and I encourage you all to do so. With that said, I'd like to introduce you to our special guest, Dr. Michael Krishman. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to be here to speak with you about a really important topic. And it is really exciting to be in women's sexual health in today's day and age. I think things are changing with leaps and bounds. There's new innovative uh, technology. There's new medications. Um, and many uh, things are on the horizon. So I think it's quite timely and very uh, exciting to be here uh, to speak with you. I bring forth a, a very different perspective because not only am I a sexual medicine clinician, I'm also a counselor. So we'll try to give you a high-level uh, overview in terms of female sexual health and function and really try to do a deep dive into some of the therapeutics and go from there. Um, so these are the learning objectives. We'll talk a little bit about the causes and treatment of sexual dysfunction, primarily focusing on the woman uh, herself, go over some of the models, and then kind of do a deep dive into some of the therapeutics to give you some tools in order to address these issues with the patients that you are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is the typical linear response that we see for the female uh, as she moves through desire, then goes to arousal, plateau, orgasm, and she may have one or multiple, and then there's a resolution. This was typically the linear model described originally by Masters and further um, expanded by Kaplan as well. And uh, we see here that the response may be a variety of different types of models where a woman may have one uh, orgasmic response or two large ones or she may have multiple small ones and then go through resolution. 
And again, uh, the male linear model is typically the model that uh, most will ascribe to. But for women, there are some women that have this linear model where they go from one facet to the next, whether it's um, the excitement, plateau, orgasmic release, and resolution, um, or they may stay at the orgasmic uh, level and have multiple orgasms in one uh, sexual experience. We see how this model has changed and modified over time, and this is Rosemary Bethan's circular model, which, although it looks may be uh, a little more problematic and may uh, appear much more complicated, this really is the underlying facet that desire may not be spontaneous. It may be that a woman may start off as sexually neutral, whether she can take it or leave sexual function, but if she does get aroused, and if arousal precedes desire, then she may actually uh, have more improved desire. And again, uh, many women certainly ascribe to this where they have a state of neutrality, and then if they are in the uh, activity of sexual function and the arousal is rewarding, and they may have orgasm or what have you, it may lead to more uh, sexual desire. And, and we certainly see this paradigm as well. So again, the circular model really reinforces the concept that desire is not necessarily a spontaneous event, but may actually be a reactive desire to in, innate uh, arousal that occurs. And from this diagram, we certainly see that sexual function really is a multifactorial uh, interplay of a variety of different facets. We certainly see that um, a lot of these factors may contribute to your overall sexual pleasure and sexual response cycle. Things like your medical history, your early sexual experiences, uh, external stressors like stress and fatigue certainly are impactful. And the biology, the underlying biology, whether it is your veins, arteries, nerves, hormones, CNS, uh, neurotransmitters, certainly are very important in priming the system to act or react. We certainly know that medical illnesses, chronic medical illness, illnesses, have direct and indirect effects. The medications we prescribe may in be impactful. Uh, chronic uh, medical illnesses, like um, chronic coughing, may impact the vaginal integrity. We know that high blood pressure, diabetes, certainly affect the neurovascular transmission as well. And again, uh, there are cultural beliefs, societal expectations, as well as family upbringing. And the partner uh, relationship certainly is also vital. So although it is multifactorial, I think it is quite important, as we as clinicians do our history and physical, we certainly get a better insight in terms of what is actually happening in terms of the overall etiological facets that may be impactful for sexual function. And this is another model in, in order to kind of discern it in a much more simplistic way. We have the bio, psycho, sociocultural, and interpersonal issues. And again, the biology, we know that it's the veins, arteries, nerves, the anatomical basis as well as sociocultural, the cultural norms, the upbringing, the expectations, and interpersonal issues, whether it's related to uh, life stressors or the relationship. And we also know that depression, anxiety, as well as other psychological factors may be impactful. So the biopsychosocial model is a very useful one in terms of uh, understanding what is going on as we uh, are assessing our patient before us in terms of trying to find the etiological facet that is happening during a uh, interview and a discussion concerning sexual problems. Here are the definitions, and again, these are found in the diagnostic manual, and again, these are the coding, and again, you have female orgasmic issues, as well as uh, recognizing that these symptoms have to be persistent. So everybody has transient issues, and we see that there's female sexual interest arousal disorder. We all wax and wane in terms of our sexual pleasure, sexual interest. We all have sexual problems at one time or another. 
However, to be a disorder, really you need a sustained issue of six months duration. And again, you can read through these. There's absence or reduced interest. There's lack of reactivity, as well as decreased sexual thoughts and what have you. So again, recognizing we don't want to over-pathologize uh, the issues of female sexual problems. But again, we want to recognize the impact that they are having in our patients, and we want to diagnose them and treat them effectively as well. There is also a pain disorder. This is GPPPD, and again, this is the old vaginismus and dyspareunia. They are lumped together, and again, there's pain on penetration. There may be pelvic pain as well, and again, you want a minimum of six months duration in order to make this official diagnosis. Uh, again, we see that classification may be defined by onset, whether it's lifelong or acquired. And in this subset, we know that if it is lifelong, you've never had previously uh, good functioning. And acquired, you really did have a period of normal functioning prior. Generalized and situational, again, all situations um, will be more of a generalized uh, overview in terms of sexual problems, situational. Uh, certainly under certain circumstances you have problems and others you do not. And again, the best example is if I go on vacation uh, to Bora Bora and I'm, everything is great and wonderful in terms of my sex life, it may be a situational issue. And again, if I am having problems no matter where I am, it's more generalized. And again, you want to characterize this personal distress. And again, really recognize that this is an important facet in the overall, uh, overall issue. People are really suffering in silence, and it's quite impactful not only on the person, but also on the relationship and also on their social uh, network. So again, understanding these issues is certainly very, very important. Now, this slide really reiterates the concept that if there is one problem please search for another one. And there are concentric overlapping circles. We know that very commonly as we uh, see our women that are aging, we certainly see issues related to um, dryness, which will lead to vaginal pain, and then lowered sexual interest. As well, in conjunction with arousal and orgasm issues, if you are mentally disconnected, you won't be aroused. Your orgasms will not be as strong as an attempt. So again, there's concentric overlapping circles. So if you certainly have one uh, problem, really look for other ones because it's quite rare that they um, will uh, exist in isolation. Very common to have that. Now, if we look at the prevalence and we look at preside, we'll see here that sexual problems really in this large study were really quite prevalent. And that's where we come up with the 43.1% of problems quite prevalent across the board, whether it's desire, arousal, orgasm, or any problem. But then when you look at the red marks, that is added to distress. So again, we all have transient ups and downs in our sex life, maybe situational, maybe related to work, fatigue, stress, children, uh, illnesses, or uh, mild uh, low mood. But again, this distressing concept really is quite vital, and these are very impactful. So again, asking the patient themselves what their concepts are in terms of how they're feeling is quite important. And here we see that we know that lowered desire is really has far-reaching implications. Women will complain of lowered self-esteem, they have mood instability, they may lead to depression, and certainly it leads to a lot of strange issues with their partners. So again, understanding the impact of sexual problems is really important because we as clinicians want our patients to have less distress. So again, the esoteric concept of sex is just uh, an emotional connection is uh, really an archaic way of thinking. We now know that women who have sexual problems, whether it's desire, arousal, or orgasm, have far-reaching implications both medically, psychologically, and also impact on their relationships as well. And this just reiterates that, that we know that women, again, if you look across the board, low desire, arousal, or pain issues, they have lowered happiness, lowered emotional satisfaction, and lower physical distress. So again, uh, very important that sexual health and general health are very much interrelated. 
So we really want our patients to do well sexually. Um, this is just a quick refresher in terms of the external anatomy, and again, uh, a good detailed history. Physical exam is quite important. We see the vaginal opening with the labia minora and majora as well, as well as examining the clitoris and the clitoral hood as well when we're doing a detailed gynecological exam, and this is just good for a, a, a basic reference. Now, many of us really recognize the clitoral arms. They are circumferential around the vaginal opening. And again, this has reiterated that the first about inch of the uh, introitus is really the area of the genital pelvic clitoral complex that is really important in terms of arousal. So when the vaginal walls are moved and displaced, we see that the clitoral arms are also moved and displaced, and the curae or the arms, this is transmitted back to the glands. And again, we now know that many women, the vast majority of women, need direct clitoral stimulation, whether it is either direct at the glands or directly stimulated by the, the arms, in order to achieve appropriate arousal and orgasmic response. So again, this is just another view in order to get everybody's perspective in terms of understanding where the bladder is and uh, the uterus and as well as the urethra and understand that the, um, the first uh, uh, about inch within the introitus or the introidal area is the most important facet in terms of sexual arousal and excitement. So we do know that sexual health is general health, and again, here are a variety of uh, different little facts in terms of understanding that the hormonal changes, whether it is increasing the oxytocin or increasing uh, you know, your overall pleasure hormones, they have far-reaching implications not only on improved general health and happiness, but lowered stress as well. We know that it uh, has cardiovascular implications as well as effects on the immunity, as well as effects on sexual self-esteem. So I think the concept of linking sexual health and general health is quite important. And in my clinical practice, what I do is I tell, I say to my patients, I ask all of my patients these questions um, in order to better take care of you as a comprehensive a person, and sexual health is a vital aspect of the human experience. This is a general overview. These are a variety of healthcare providers that are certainly involved in evaluation of um, a sexual problem. There's clinicians, there's therapists, counselors, nurses, allied healthcare providers. We want to do appropriate diagnostics, and then we'll give you an overview in terms of therapeutic interventions. So this is just the overall uh, evaluation in terms of how we're going to do, do it. You Again, a good history, uh, whether it's by intake form, by your allied healthcare providers. We want to get a good understanding of the past um, experience in terms of what they were doing previously, how it has changed, and what their overall uh, goals are for the future. Uh, we want to make sure that there's no other underlying uh, psychological issues, and uh, one of the best things we do is a quick screen for depression. You may also want to use some office screeners, and these are quick, easy intake uh, questionnaires, and we'll show you one of them that I use uh, specifically for vaginal laxity. Um, and the, uh, you know, you may want to use the FSFI, it's a 19-item uh, question. The DSDS is a, a five question for, um, for desire. The VLQ is a one question in order to assess for laxity. And then the intake is, uh, the love intake is really um, the looseness of the vagina evaluation intake, which is really about uh, assessing the impact. Uh, the history and screeners may uh, certainly give you a very, very good insight in terms of what the overall uh, underlying problems are. And again, these are confirmed by physical exam, uh, whether it's warranted, and then uh, at some point some lab tests may be necessary as well. And this is just a quick screener. Um, you know, I always say, I always ask all my patients about sexual health. Are you currently involved in a sexual relationship? If they say yes, uh, do you have any concerns with pain? Do you have any concerns with vaginal arousal um, um, or, um, or orgasm? 
And then if they say no, you just really open up the door and let them know that this is a safe, comfortable environment that they can continue to ask us questions should they have any other uh, concerns. This is the love intake that I alluded to. And again, this is a patient intake that certainly is available. And again, it includes uh, some questions about uh, the impact, do you have any uh, changes in terms of vaginal integrity, are you leaking urine, are you uh, feeling loose during intercourse or reduced sensation, and this is primarily used for uh, assessing people who have vaginal laxity. And again, then you will, how do you rate your current level of looseness, and then again, the uh, section three is really related to arousal uh, and enjoyment and what have you. And then the bottom line is, do you think some degree of looseness has affected your partner's experience as well? So again, getting the patient's um, feedback as well as the uh, patient's overall experience uh, is quite important. So it's important to put this into context as well. Um, I think it's really important as a clinician to really use personalized language, open-ended questions, and also effective use of silence in terms of the overall evaluation and assessment. Um, I think we uh, very often interrupt our patients and we get very anxious, and we know from the literature that if we just allow our patients to speak, they will direct us to the right answer. And there's been data to support the fact that this isn't uh, overburdensome in terms of patients helping us get the right diagnosis. I think it's also important to set realistic expectations. There's nothing worse than over-promising and under-delivering. And again, uh, setting the stage for appropriate therapeutic interventions is quite important. We know that as women age, uh, there are certainly changes in the estrogen and other steroid hormones. We see vaginal dryness, inflammation, thinning of the tissues, decreased lubrication and soreness. There may also be urinary symptoms as well. So looking at the menopausal woman, I think it's very important to assess that the integrity of the vaginal tissue, uh, very importantly, in, in order to assess whether or not an intervention is certainly warranted. And again, if you look at the uh, genital urinary syndrome of menopause, which is the vaginal dryness, uh, not only the vagina, the vulva, and what have you, there is limited data and emerging data with the lasers, uh, but however, there is uh, no large randomized clinical trial um, that has been done in this specific population uh, using radiofrequency to treat uh, genital urinary syndrome of menopause, and it hasn't been adequately studied. The deep has not done, uh, not been studied in this population. There are uh, investigator initiative studies around it. We do have some case studies and some emerging data, um, and again, would refer you to uh, Medical Affairs to answer any off-label questions concerning postmenopausal patients as we recognize that the tissue may be different. And again, many breast cancer survivors, again, may have vaginal dryness, men do not, and many will uh, certainly choose for local therapy, others may, may not, and energy-based uh, therapy may have a potential place for the overall treatment, and again, good large studies that are controlled, sham controlled, still need to be done in this space special population before um, making further uh, clinical recommendations. Now, this is a, a very uh, quick, easy, uh, good chart to kind of give you some of the overview in terms of the overall treatments that are available for um, the comprehensive treatment of sexual problems. And I always say, like, it's nice to have a war chest with a lot of opportunities from conservative to more aggressive uh, that you can offer for patients. So you certainly have counseling and therapy. You can have behavioral techniques. Um, you can also uh, implement different devices, the Sierra, the arousal for her. There are self-stimulators. There's dilators that help with progressive tightness. Um, if someone is overly uh, complaining of sexual pain, uh, dilators may help with 
uh, the vaginal integrity. Um, uh, vibrators may help with direct clitoral stimulation. There are moisturizers and lubricants. Moisturize maintain the integrity and non-hormonal ones. Lubricants may help with the lovemaking. And again, some moisturizers uh, uh, that I prefer are Lubrigin. They have hyaluronic acid and elastin. They tend to work very well. Lubricants, things like silicone-based lube, like Uber Lube or Silk, also work very, very well. Silk is water-based. Uber Lube is uh, silicone-based. There are certainly a multitude of herbs and supplements that can be used, and many of these have emerging data, things like Strong Vivo, uh, or Synergy, and what have you. Again. Um, but again, limited data to support their efficacy, safety, and they often interact with conventional medications. Hormones certainly can be used. There's estrogen uh, as well as off-label things like testosterone, and these certainly have a lot of data to support their use, especially in the concept of HSCD or hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Uh, Flibanserin or Addy is the only drug that is FDA approved for premenopausal generalized acquired HSDV. However, we are using off-label medications including centrally acting uh, bupropion or Wellbutrin. There, as, in, uh, as outpatient issues, we certainly have acupuncture and mindfulness, physical therapy, behavioral therapy, as well as counseling, which I think are quite important adjuncts in order to uh, help patients uh, cope with sexual problems as well. We do have a variety of energy-based devices, whether it's radio frequency with cooling or without cooling, as well as lasers, and uh, those certainly can be effective in certain situations. And even more aggressively, we're seeing that even some surgical interventions may be appropriate for certain patients under certain circumstances as well. Uh, we know lifestyle factors are certainly important. Things like physical activity, social support, a healthy diet are also very important. And we know that decreasing, um, uh, that if people are inactive, depressed, or obese, that was, will certainly be impactful and certainly impact sexual function. So the first thing is really is to increase your healthy diet and uh, social support. Physical activity will be very important in your overall sexual health and wellness. We talk about vaginal laxity, and again, I think this is very important to differentiate. This is vaginal laxity really is a medical condition uh, at the vaginal introitus, and I think it is quite important to recognize that this may be a result of a variety of different factors, most commonly from childbirth, overstretching, as well as trauma, and this has far-reaching implications on the woman and her overall sexual satisfaction. She may have a, a negative impact on her quality of life, as well as may have complaints of the overall changes that are occurring in her sexual relationship. And women do not discuss this. So this is quite uh, understood that we've seen this in a multitude of studies, whether it's a U.S.-based study or a female uh, study done in Japan, and women will not talk about this due to embarrassment, apprehension, and overall general trend in sexual medicine is that they will not talk about these uh, issues uh, directly. So again, it's very important for us as clinicians to initiate the conversation. And this is how I like to divide up uh, sexual uh, concerns related to laxity, you have vulvar laxity, which is really can be an aesthetic as well as an functional issue. Uh, women will complain of a, a loose, unattractive vulvar anatomy, asymmetry, and the functional issue may be related to dyspareunia. They may have discomfort wearing clothes, displacement into the introitus. They may have uncomfortable sensations of tethering during sports activities. The issue related to the vaginal introidal laxity is really, as we discussed earlier, about the clitoral complex being affected, arousal, orgasmic response, and this is primarily a functional issue. And again, we know that women may have vaginal canal laxity, and this is maybe associated with urinary issues, fecal incontinence, cystoceles, rectoceles. So again, this is an important concept to differentiate, and we know that women may have one, 
two or all of these at the same time. So again, recognize that they may be overlapping, they may be um, developed in, in isolation. So I think it's quite important to remember that the whole concept of vaginal laxity can be divided into vulvar laxity, vaginal introidal laxity, and vaginal canal laxity, and they may coexist all in the same patient as well. And this is really the impact. Uh, I see this quite often in the patients that I'm assessing. They have changes in sexual function. They have changes in sexual self-esteem. They don't feel as sexy. They don't feel as feminine. They may have vaginal symptoms or passing gas through the vagina, as well as they may also suffer from urinary uh, and uh, incontinence and leakage of urine as well. So this whole disease process really has far-reaching implications on the woman her sexual self-esteem and her sexual function as well. We know that vaginal laxity can occur in a variety of different situations. This is a certainly a beginning of the list. We know that there's medical issues, whether it's COPD, genetic issues. We know that in hormonal uh, issues related to uh, the menopause, we know that during pregnancy there may be changes as well. And we also see that uh, delivery may be impactful as well, as well as some behavioral issues and new emerging data that there may be some issues related to the athletic activities uh, listed here. So it's not just vaginal deliveries that may cause this. We know chronic medical disease, hormonal issues related to uh, uh, delivery, as well as some behavioral issues may all have an important facets that contribute to the overall condition of vaginal laxity. And again, I think the most important issue in discussion is that the woman herself is complaining of the problem. So again, it's a lock and key situation. The woman herself is saying, there are problems, I'm feeling uncomfortable, I'm not feeling as aroused, I'm not feeling interested. So we don't want to uh, treat a woman who is not complaining. So again, recognize that we want to screen out bad relationships and we want to screen out coercion. So it's very important that the woman herself is complaining. It's a significant unmet need. We've seen this in multitude studies where we've screened both OBGYNs. They recognize that it's a problem. We screen women and they recognize it's a problem. But it's a disconnect. We are not treating people effectively. And we know that the treatment paradigm, which is evolving, isn't really as adequate as we need. And this is where our therapeutic interventions have much more benefit. And we will certainly talk about those in just one minute. Uh, we know that if we talk to women, uh, they value important therapeutic interventions. They recognize that an adequate treatment will have far-reaching implications, not only on her sexual function, but also on her partner. She'll have better orgasms. She'll have um, much better uh, confidence during uh, lovemaking and what have you. So again, women want effective treatment that will improve her overall sexual functioning. And again, laxity is actually much more prevalent than weight gain or urinary incontinence in terms of post-delivery complications. So we're not doing a good job. We're not asking the right questions. We're not getting the right answers and recognizing that we certainly can have a huge impact if we offer our patients uh, something. So again, this is just reiterating, again, when we're looking at therapeutic interventions for vaginal laxity, we're talking about the introitus, we're talking about the clitoral complex, the first about inch into the vaginal canal, which will improve sexual function as well. So again, if you look at the Genevieve system, this will uh, be impactful at the level of the introitus and, and has been shown um, to be effective in uh, improving sexual function and sexual satisfaction. And we know this is the primary region for the sexual pleasure areas. It's coupling with the friction, the key women's sensation. There's dense fibrous tissue here. And um, again, if you look at the difference, and I think this is a take home message, the difference between the laser and RF with cooling as the Genevieve system does, this 
is a much deeper treatment. So the RF with cooling is much deeper. It has um, stimulates fibroblastic activation, neocollagen deposition as well. When the vaginal canal la lasers really are looking more at a superficial treatment in terms of uh, treating the mucosal area. The challenge with vaginal laxity really is that there is no objective measure. And uh, men and women will experience sexuality differently. Uh, vaginal laxity may be perceived by one person or the other uh, very differently. One woman may uh, not have laxity. She may have sexual pleasure. And on the exam, it may look like uh, the vaginal canal is uh, enormously uh, loose. Again, we have seen in multiple uh, reviews that there is no real objective measure of vaginal laxity. Uh, and again, the woman herself, the patient reported outcome, is actually the best predictor, her subjective sexual experience. We've looked, tried to look at uh, satisfying sexual events, we looked at clitoral blood flow, ultrasound, pictures, and again, the woman herself is the best indicator and there's no real good objective measure. And again, validated scales like the FSFI, Female Sexual Function Index, are the widely accepted as the best indicators of female sexual function. A 7 to 8, uh, 7 to 28 day recall period really resonates with the woman herself. So. Again, the woman herself is the best predictor of vaginal laxity in terms of her overall functioning. This is the, the treatment paradigm that I have uh, constructed. And again, it kind of goes through from most conservative to most aggressive. We see that there's a lot of vaginal tightening products that are really making unsubstantiated claims. They're over the counter. They're not regulated. They may damage the ecosystem, cause microabrasions and sometimes very, very concerning. We certainly see that there's behavioral techniques. Uh, and again, this is uh, things like uh, pelvic floor physical therapy. Uh, and again, uh, very important that these may be time consuming. They have limited uh, long-term effects. And again, there's some uh, publications to support this, but they are very, very time consuming. Uh, they are low risk and safe, but again, certainly problematic with some patients in terms of the commitment and the compliance. Next, we have uh, energy base, which is really an intermediate um, uh, area. We now know that there's a radio frequency uh, with cooling. There's regular radio frequency. There is uh, issues related to laser, and again, uh, a variety of different products with a variety of different levels of evidence. Uh, the uh, Genevieve system is a one uh, system, one treatment, 30-minute outpatient uh, process, and again, very, very important. Uh, and it, the thing that differentiates it is there's a large randomized clinical trial, sham controlled, uh, that has shown efficacy as well as safety. Now, the most aggressive and the most expensive really is surgery. And again, um, there are certainly patients that may benefit from uh, severe uh, deficits and severe problems. And again, I think it's quite important to recognize that this is an invasive procedure. It may have uh, far-reaching complications as well as it depends on the clinical skill of the clinician. I think this slide really is quite essential, and it really talks about the issues related to RF treatment, how it uh, goes about the depth, three to five millimeters depth. It stimulates fibroblastic uh, activation, which will have subtly modifications of collagen. Uh, and it really will uh, affect the functional architecture. Uh, the difference is that the cooling really will protect the surface. And again, this protects the surface while enables significant uh, heating underlying, which is controlled uh, as well. So again, this is a re reproducible, monopolar, stable, uh, and protective. 
So I think very, very different than just randomly heating uh, tissue with other uh, potential devices and what have you. So again, I think that the concept of cooling coupled with heat is quite uh, important. And this is the mechanism of action. It creates an electrical field under the RF tip. Uh, again, it heats at three to five millimeters deep, activates the fibroblastic um, activation, neocollagen deposition, and again, there's restoration, and uh, this may take up to uh, three months after the RF treatment. So it's a one-time treatment, and collagen remodeling may occur up to three months after. And this, again, uh, the sustained effect of this one treatment has been shown to be at least uh, between nine and 12 months as well. So again, I think it's quite important to recognize that uh, our patients are really suffering in silence. We do recognize that uh, uh, if we don't ask, we can't treat the problem. Uh, and again, we all may be on the other side of the table at some point, so we have to create comfortable healthcare environments. Uh, we have to use the right language, provide privacy. Uh, safety as well as a comprehensive treatment paradigm that includes both conservative, aggressive uh, treatments to help manage these problems. And I think uh, women are really uh, suffering in silence and they will be eternally grateful if we address their sexual health concerns because I think that sexual health and general health are very much intertwined and uh, women recognize the value of uh, their sexual well-being, and it behooves us as clinicians to address these uh, concerns. And with that, I will conclude uh, with today's webinar. I thank you for your attention and uh, appreciate uh, you uh, coming and listening to this very important talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishman, and I want to thank all of our attendees for being here today. Just before we leave, a couple points to, to make note of. Uh, I love this slide, Dr. Krishman, where it shows the prevalence of female sexual problems, and um, it was a, a staggering or shocking to me that 43.1% of women uh, showed that they had some, some level of, of sexual problems. Uh, that just says to me that this is a much bigger issue that can be addressed by you uh, are our providers um, at some stage, and and uh, I want to reiterate the fact that um, you know Dr. Krishman explained during the webinar, um, you know the the uh, the commonality or or the the fact that vaginal laxity and sexual function are so common. Uh, that is why we chose to work with a true women's health company, the Vive, over other device companies. So if you have any questions for Dr. Krishman about this or uh, for us, please use that survey that's going to pop up after the end of the webinar presentation today uh, to do so. And once again, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Dr. Krishman, for joining us, and we hope to see you at our next webinar presentation. Great.